Good afternoon and welcome to the regular meeting of the, of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College, convening at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, December uh, 11th. We do have a quorum, so we will start the meeting. And if we could, please begin with a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, even though you're not officially sworn in today, I'm going to ask you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you don't mind, uh, Coach Salinas. <coughs> Your first job. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a tradition here that uh, will be new to some of you since we've got lots of visitors today. We always uh, start our meeting by reading together the mission statement, which is a, a wonderful reminder of why we're here and what we're about in terms of serving the students. So please join me. Del Mar College, College provides access to quality education, education workforce preparation, preparation, and lifelong learning for student and community success. I do want to remind you that Del Mar College is streaming the live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, ex with the exception of the portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. And I would also remind you and encourage you to be sure that your phones are in the silent mode. Um, we have an unofficial rule here that if your phone goes off, you get to come to the front and sing, I'm a little teapot, and I'm sure no one really <laughs> wants to do that today. Um, and lastly, I want to make a note that there will be one agenda correction. Uh, the printed agenda that's here uh, we will uh, does not include, but we will have uh, public comments before we go into closed session later in the agenda. And so with that, we're going to begin with our agenda. And the very first order of business is to swear in officially our newest member of the Board of Regents. We'd like to welcome uh, Coach Hector Salinas. And uh, Mr. Salinas, if you'll join us down front along with your wife and uh, Judge Nora Longoria, uh, and Dr. Eskin and I will join you there, and we will do the swearing in. Oh, yes, please. Yes, that's
I'm the other way. Yes, when the red light is on, you can speak. Where is it on? Oh, yeah, I didn't see it on that side. Yeah. I'm going to allow each of the uh, newly uh, sworn in regents to uh, add any comments they would like to. I'm going to start with you, Gabe Rivas, and then we'll go to you, Coach Salinas. So, Gabe, you want to go first? Yes, I just want to make a quick thank you to my voters, my constituents, and to the whole Delmar family. I'm fortunate to have already been here 18 years, and I'm looking forward to the next six years and see what more we can accomplish to make Delmar great again, or Delmar great, just Delmar greater. <laughs> I was thinking Trump. <laughs> fake news, fake news. I didn't mean MAGA. That's not <laughs> <laughs> about the A. <laughs> great, thank you. Coach Salinas. First of all, I'd like to thank God for giving me this opportunity that I've been really looking forward all my life. I've always wanted to be in a situation where I can have an impact on kids. And you know, what better place than here at Del Mar Junior College. So I'm really looking forward to it. But I also would like to give thanks to all those people that went out there and voted and, and had the confidence to put me in this situation. But I also want to give special thanks to some of my family members that have really played a major part in my life. For example, my wife, my kids, my brother-in-law Leo, and my sister-in-law Mary, they have played a major part. My brother-in-law, Leo, is the kind of guy that always advises me and gives me all the information that I need. He's like a father figure to me. And I really appreciate and love them for what they do for me all my life. They've been there for me. They've supported me. And now, you know, I, uh, I feel like I've got this, this situation that I'm in right now is one that uh, it was placed in front of me by God. And now I intend to do the best I can for our kids, for our community, for Del Mar. And you know, what better place, like I said, to help the kids succeed, succeed in life. And that's what I want to do. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, as we say hello to a new region, it also means that we unfortunately have to say goodbye to a region. And I want to take a moment to thank uh, Sandra Messbarger, who has been on our Board of Regents for six years, has been a wonderful addition. Um, most of you know that Sandra brings a multitude of talents uh, to our board. Um, her representation of the students, and particularly the arts program and music, uh, besides leading us in some great singing every once in a while and singing to us, uh, she has brought a wonderful perspective uh, to the board, and so we thank you for that. Sandra, I'm going to invite you and Dick uh, to the front. Uh, we've got a little something for you, and I'm going to also ask the other regents to come around. We're going to take a group picture with you, if that's okay. So regents, if you join us, and Dr. Smith. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
One more time. There you go. You know, when you're learning to do buildings and as a musician, I didn't know what an envelope was. So uh, all of you have become personal friends, and I will say that you have got a dream team. Dr. Espinosa. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> the, the, um, all the scholarships, he was so impressed by all the stories. And um, he didn't, when he married me, he didn't know music, but now he sings. And <laughs> when we both came into the Del Mar family, we both learned a great deal. And thank you so much for being so wonderful. Uh, I want to thank all my friends. Before you before you leave the podium, I, I have a hunch that some of our regents may want to express some of their sentiments too. So I'm just going to open it up in case any regent would like to. I'd say. like to say thank you very much for your service, Sandra. Uh, I appreciate your passion for music. I appreciate your passion for the students, especially the music students. I know that's your 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 favorite. <laughs> but anyway, all overall, you did a good job. Uh, we enjoyed your service, and continue to support Delmar. I know you will. You always have. Former, former, you're an alumni. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for uh, guiding me in my first two years. I got to sit over there beside me, and I got to ask you all the dumb questions so that I didn't have to ask them in public. But thank you for your uh, leadership and your guidance and your experience, and thank you for your voice for students. I always knew that that's where your heart was, that's where your passion was, and I think you have passed that on to me for sure and I think to, to this entire board. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for uh, your input. Uh, for me and you, music has always been important. And uh, the passion that you brought to the board, especially during the second phase of the music project, was fantastic. Thank you. So Sandra, I didn't know you as long as most of the others, but you were my partner right here and kept me straight and also even let me use your stool, which I really appreciated. <laughs> so I know you've got a real passion for Del Mar and for education, and I know you'll continue to serve in whatever capacity you can. Sandra, thank you for your dedication. We will miss you, and I will miss you. Even if I had a voice, <laughs> there aren't enough words to describe what you've done for Del Mar. Sandra, and I, I'm going to go with you. I'll tell you what, I'll go next and you can get a... Sure. Indra, have that mark. Great. I want to add one more comment to what I said earlier. You've made a number of jokes to us about um, being height challenged, but you actually stand very tall in all of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And for everything that people have said, you stand up tall and straight for the students. You stand up for their needs. You stand up for the little things like covered walkways so their instruments don't get wet. You've always been a a tall, strong, important voice. So for that, thank you. And I know you will stay plugged in through the foundation and other things. So we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Sandra, it's been a fun six years. Our relationship has grown tremendously. I think it grew from strangers to now loved ones. It's, an, it's been an amazing journey. I so appreciated those dumb questions because we need to ask. This is That's what a board, a public, publicly elected board is about. It's about people who come from the community, former alums such as yourself, who come back and ask the questions and bring your strengths and work to your strengths knowing what you do know and what you don't know. That gave other people courage to ask. You, you gave them um, uh, just strength 
by being yourself. You never changed, and that's just been an amazing. Uh, that that's I think was your amazing contribution to the to uh, to Del Mar College. Of course, the buildings and, and the music students who will benefit for generations to come, and you and I will enjoy it along the way with performances and watching them watching them uh, enjoy the classroom space that you have your fingerprints on. Thank you very much. We love you so much. Appreciate you. Another uh, duty or responsibility that we have when we reconstitute the board every two years is to elect officers. Uh, that will be the next section of our agenda, and the way this will work is we will start with the uh, election for chair of the officer, and then I'll pass the gavel off to whoever's elected to be chair, and then they will conduct the, not only the rest of the officer elections, but they will also conduct the rest of the meeting. Uh, we have four positions to elect today. It's chair, first vice chair, second vice chair, and secretary, and those four uh, people and those positions constitute the executive committee of uh, the Board of Regents. And so with that, I'm going to start with chair. Uh, is there anyone that would have a, a nomination for chair? Mr. Chair, um, before I make the nomination, I want to thank you for your service. I don't know, I've been here 18 years, and I don't know anybody that's been the board chair for so many years. And just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to nominate Carol Scott for the office of chair of the Board of Regents. We've got a motion for Carol. Do we have a second? Second. We have multiple seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's good. We don't. Okay. Um, do we have any other nominations from the floor for chair? Hearing none, do we have a motion to accept by acclamation, or do we even need to do that, Augie? Just I still okay. move, Mr. Chair. Motion, second for acclamation. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I am very proud and pleased to pass the gavel <laughs> after <laughs> several times. Major, please. <laughs> Can't tell you how excited I am. To pass <laughs> there you go. Thank oh. you, I think. <laughs> <sighs> well, first of all, thank you all very much, Gabe. Thank you for uh, that nomination, and I thank you all for supporting me. Um, I will do my uh, utmost with a lot of guidance and help from, uh, from you all to fill the, the shoes, uh, fill the seat that uh, Trey has held for uh, in such spectacular terms for so many years. Uh, he is a hard act to follow, so I'm going to ask your grace and patience as I uh, try to, to move us through the next few months. Um, and I know that he will be there as a, as a backup for me and as a, a person to call when I need that experience. Um, so moving on, we will uh, now accept nominations for first vice chair of the board, Mr. Salinas. I'd like to nominate Mr. Rios. Thank you. Thank Are you. there, congratulations, Mr. Rivas. Are there any other nominations for first vice chair? Seeing none, is that a motion for acclamation then? Is there a second to that motion to accept Mr. Rivas by acclamation? Second, uh, second by uh, Ms. Dr. Sherwood. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Congratulations, thank Mr. Rivas. You, thank you. And I look forward to working with you and the rest of the board also. Uh, we always have a lot to do to make Del Mar greater. And I, and I <laughs> said it right this time. <laughs> and, and I appreciate your experience that, that will we'll be there. Thank you, sir. I will now open up nominations for second vice chair of the board. Dr. Sherwood. Uh, I'd like to nominate Dr. Nick Adame for second vice chair. Thank you. A second. Second. Are there any other nominations for second vice chair? Then we'll move that to a motion for acclamation, Dr. Sherwood, and a second, second. by Mr. Salinas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Congratulations, Dr. Adami. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking forward to working with you. Voice of experience today. We'll have <laughs> continued experience on our executive committee. And now we'll open up the uh, floor for nominations for secretary. And Chair, I'd like to nominate Dr. Mary Sherwood for secretary, please. Thank you. Is that the, are we ending the voices? <laughs> 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 are there any other nominations for secretary of the board? not can we make, move that to acclamation please is there a second, second. or second by mr revis 
All those in favor of the motion to uh, elect Dr. Sherwood as secretary of the board, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. Congratulations, Dr. Sherwood. We Pleasure. look forward to your experience uh, with us on the executive committee. Thank you, and I also will be looking forward to uh, talking with some of my predecessors <laughs> <laughs> to learn. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I'd like to have a couple of comments. Again, I think any of us that want to uh, express our appreciation to Mr. McCampbell for his work. In fact, I'm going to do this. I'm going to knock him Let's over make there. It official. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it official. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Escamillo? I'd like to start with some comments and thank uh, Mr. McCampbell, Trey, for his service to this college. Again, another former student of Del Mar College has led uh, this college for so many years. And the majority of my 10 years here, you've been my chair. We have accomplished a lot as chair and president. Uh, isn't, that's an understatement. You and I have lots of years to still roll that out and talk about. Uh, the wins and, and, and some losses along the way. But um, again, I think what I really wanted to express to everyone out there is, you know, many, we have many, many um, fellow Vikings out there who, who are students here at Del Mar College. And, and Mr. McCampbell is a, is, a, is a great example of what Del Mar prepares here in the community in the way of preparing its students. And, um, and so I hope you all uh, recognize that, and I want you know, I want to thank you, Trey, for being a leader and doing the things that you've done. It's been an incredible, incredible nine and a half years. Um, that's that's set records in so many different ways. Again, we don't have enough time today. We'd have to have a separate board meeting just to just to, just to list that. But um, thank you, thank you for being such a great leader. Any other comments before we move on with business? Yeah. <laughs> Follow me. Thumbs up. There you go. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, now we get to the other fun part of our meeting, which is the uh, recognitions of uh, student and staff and faculty. So we're going to start with Ms. Claudia Jackson DeFries. I'm going to share this wonderful responsibility. My pleasure to introduce Polly Martinez, Chair of the Non-Institute Council, to announce those who are our Circle of Pride. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are y'all? Well, I'm Polly Martinez. I'm the chairperson for the uh, non exempt council here at Del Mar College. I represent all the non exempt employees. And every semester, we have a, an employee that we recognize for going over and beyond their regular duties. This semester we had two, uh, uh, well not applicants, they were candidates, they're both candidates. One of them's not able to be here with us today, he's sick, so we'll present him later on with that. Uh, one of the ones that we're recognizing today is Gregory Sanchez. He works for the Business Administration Department, and we're very proud to, for, to present him with a certificate and also a $500 check for his contribution to Del Mar College, everything we've done. And we have a large, big goodie bag. It happens when we get everybody together to get stuff together for him. And this is all Del Mar memorabilia. So it's a fun bag. Thank you all so much. Thank you. My name 
name is Rosalind Swanson. I am uh, the Secretary of Student Government Association, and I am a geologist. Hi, I'm Sabrina Newman, Monday Treasurer of SGA, and I graduated no class from nursery and I'm now in forensic and applied science. Hi, everybody. My name is Natasha Perez. I'm currently a speech communication major, and I'm also the president of SGA this, this academic year. Um, I wanted to share with you guys kind of some things that we going on and the things that we're working on in this semester. But before I do that, um, on behalf of my fellow officers and the rest of the student body here at Del Mar, we just wanted to thank you guys for supporting and increasing the student services fee. We're very fortunate because this, has in, this increase in the fee has allowed us to embark on and provide engaging and educational programs and experiences for the Del Mar College student body. Um, one of the biggest projects the student government has been able to aid is the DMC Student Food Pantry. Uh, when this proposal was brought forth to us at our initial meeting of the semester, not only did we vote to approve, but we voted to increase the funds to support this cause. Um, initially, it was $6,000, and we actually voted to raise it to $10,000, just so we could provide more resources for our students here at Del Mar College. But not only have we been able to lend back into more accessible resources for our students, but out of these funds, we were also able to go to the Association for the Promotion of Campus Activities Conference in Houston, uh, where we watched performers such as motivational speakers, musicians, artists, and comedians who all have an educational message to share, which is really great. We also got to sit in on educational sessions about leadership, success in marketing, and much more. <coughs> Um, the purpose of this conference was not just for us SBA officers, but so that we could book talents to come back to our campus and share this educational experience with other people here at Del Mar College, faculty and students included. Um, now, our advisor Beverly Cage has been working very hard to actually pair each um, event and performance with different departments that go along with the performance. So, for instance, we have someone who does music and raps about African American history. So we're going to hopefully um, partner with social sciences and get a lot of the history majors to come to that event so we can have more students involved here on campus. Uh, another thing that we have been working on that kind of has to do with our promotion of events is that we've been working closely with IT and the developer uh, behind IT, Darcy Jones, to create a module within the Viking Go app so that we can create a more accessible way for our students to become engaged, which is gonna be really great in getting students to come to our events and just knowing that there is a student life here even though we're a, a junior college. We wanna make sure that they have like a university experience here at Del Mar to make it fun and exciting. Uh, one of the biggest supporters in that venture has been Mr. August Alfonso, who was actually really excited to hear that the students wanted to utilize the Viking Go app for better engagement. Uh, and this fall, one of the most important events that we actually attended was our SGA Region 6 Fall Conference in Victoria, Texas. We got to network with other SGA officers from other schools in our region, prepared for our state conference in the spring, and we also participated in our community service project at the Victoria Food Bank. Moving into the spring semester, we will continue to work on projects brought forth by our student body, such as fixing issues with our Viking golf carts, and starting a DMC Green Team, which is an initiative that we want to make our campus more eco-friendly and green as we move into the future. We will also help facilitate student focus groups and have been active members on multiple committees like the Bookstore, DMC <coughs> Food Pantry, QEP Topic Selection, Strategic Planning, and Guided Pathways Committees. Furthermore, we as SGA officers are extremely thankful for our advisor, Beverly Cage, who has facilitated various opportunities for us to meet with Dr. Silva and Dr. Escamilla who have listened to our stories and needs and helped open doors, leading us in the right direction to accomplish our current and future goals. With that said, we want to thank you for your time and for not only listening to our student voices, but enabling our student voices to be heard. Thank you very much. I'm the Director of Student Leadership and Campus Life, and I happen to be the proud advisor for this group. <laughs> they know I'm very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> and I love them and I love working with students and they do a great job of what they're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. <laughs> and I, before you all leave.
Before you all leave, I do want to say thank you for your willingness to work with us on things like our strategic plan and guided pathways committees and other things that you're doing. Uh, the, that voice is very important in that upcoming process for us. And so we very sincerely thank you for your willingness to put in that extra time over and above your studies and work and everything else that you're doing because we need to hear your voices. Absolutely. Thank you. Well said. Absolutely. <laughs> we can all wave at him. That's bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations to your team, Claudia. I know that they all work very hard. And now we will move on to some faculty recognitions. And with the absence of Dr. Beth Lewis, who is at the SACS conference, I think uh, Ms. Lenora Keyes is going to do that for us.
accountable patient centered trauma and emergency health care system. This duty will attend quarterly meetings held in Austin, and the new members were formally introduced to Casa River in Fort Worth in conjunction with the Texas EMS Conference. Please join me in congratulating the students. <laughs> Just like to add, Melissa is also the chair of the faculty council as well. Extremely active, extremely busy uh, on campus, and she and I are in regular contact, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. I think we're probably all benefited by her being head of trauma too. <laughs> 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 leadership there. Uh, my next recognition is Mr. Rosier. Okay. Mr. Rosier is an honorary professor of nursing at Mr. Rozier was nominated by his peer and selected by the Faculty Professional Development Committee to be our college's 2019 Piper Professor nominee. He demonstrated his commitment to quality teaching and student success. His submission packet included the nomination form, curriculum vitae, <coughs> and five letters of support from his dean, colleagues, and former students. The foundation will select and award 10 recipients an honorarium of $5,000 each for superior teaching at the college level. If our college's nominee is chosen, the Piper Foundation Selection Committee will inform Mr. Rozier in May of 2019. So please join me in congratulating Ken Rozier. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all much. very much, Appreciate and congratulations. That. Good luck, and thank you. So with that, uh, we will move on to our staff reports. And uh, Dr. Escamilla, would you like to sure. uh, lead us into that? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. So every year, the college is required, not only is it best practice, but it is also a requirement to, to submit uh, certain uh, statistics and data about uh, the college's uh, security and safety uh, prog programs, uh, processes, assets, and everything else. And Ms. Lauren White um, has been leading that charge for several years now. And the charge is only becoming more and more complex as we move towards uh, an accreditation of our, of our own police force and so forth. I think that's an add-on to this today's conversation. but. Uh, Presenting uh, the annual security and safety report is Ms. Lauren White, and thank you for all the good work that goes in with this. Thank you, Dr. Um Wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize a few people. Obviously, this report um, couldn't be done without a few people. Um, first, I'd like to thank Claudia and her staff, um, in particular, Monica Cruz for assisting in the layout and making sure that our statistical information is compliant with the new ADA requirements. Um, I also want to thank August Alfonso and his staff. Um, IT made sure that it was posted on our webpage by October 1st, which is a requirement of the Department of Education and um, keeps us also in compliance. Um, Raul Garcia and his staff, um, in particular the print shop for their work and the production of the printed report, which you have a copy of. And finally, the clearance committee, um, compliance committee, um, which was uh, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Silva, Tammy McDonald, and Cheryl Sanders, um, for their information that is in the book, along with their um, review and uh, critiquing and uh, editing of it so that we um, got the final draft perfect. Um, then, as Dr. Escamilla pointed out, the annual safety and security report is a requirement by the Department of Education to meet the Clery standard. The report includes DMC policy procedures along with crime stats in the area. And it is uh, for prospective students, <coughs> for current students, for family members, and for faculty staff. Um, if you have any questions in regards to the actual report, I would be happy to answer those questions. Um, on the details, the stats that are reported, um, there certainly in 2017 there were some things that hadn't shown up in prior years. How do we compare it to other colleges? 
in comparison to other colleges, um, we are actually really good. Uh, our stats are um, not um, outside the norm by any means. In fact, we're on the low end. I, I looked at, of course, the problem that we run into, um, Mr. McCampbell, in relationship to trying to compare ourselves is that when you look at certain, especially other colleges in our area, those have <coughs> uh, dorms and residential halls, which we do not have. And so their numbers, especially in the areas that I know are of concern, are much higher than ours. Um, but uh, so in relationship, when you look at other colleges that are on our same level, um, that is not to be unexpected, those two reports in particular, but um, we're not any higher. Yeah. So the fact that we've got five in the primary category and two in the arrest category and nothing in the prior years, you're saying you think that's not necessarily a trend? No, because in, I know what the stats are for this year and we're back down to having nothing. Okay. Yeah. I'd like anomaly. I'd, Thank you. I'd like to add too that the, the college has enjoyed a relatively uh, uneventful um, past, if you will, with regards to these data sets. And one of the things that I knew and that I've that, that has remained a constant since I since I came on board in 2008 is the relationship, the respect um, that our that our campuses have uh, in our local communities. I mean, it, within our you know, we're, our adjacent co uh, um, neighborhoods are, are very respectful, protective of our of our campuses and so forth. They watch out for us therefore we should wa and we do watch out for them and so there's this relationship these are the things that statistics will never talk about and that I've spoken to neighbors over over the years now and how they revere this place and and, and love it and so I think you know those relationships cannot be uh, understated and uh, I think that's a critical part to these numbers right. and I think also unfortunately I think some of the like the arrest numbers what I can't stop is when an officer I know one of those arrest numbers was an officer driving down the road pulled a vehicle over um, in our parking lot it had nothing to do with Del Mar College other than that's is just happens to be close proximity the vehicle pull, pulled into our parking lot I know what they it was reported as this was the address where the arrest was made so that number had to go on to those statistical information even though it had nothing to do with Del Mar. If you'd stopped him another mile down the road, it wouldn't have been on our stats. Wiener Schnitzel's a good place for that. <laughs> <laughs> Wiener Schnitzel's a good place for a lot of things. <laughs> so you talked about this being online. Where is it located on our website? If you go to the um, safety and security um, section of the website, it is there it's also under um, a student's right to know okay so there are there are it, to get to the link there are two or three areas where they can go to either okay. the safety and security section the students right to know area um, is is two ways to get to it one thing I like about this report is it does put in one place all of the policies related to uh, criminal behavior and drug policies and all those kinds of things so if there is a member of the public who wants to know comprehensively because those policies might be located in different places other in the in our policy portion but in the Cleary report or this report they're all together so I like that I think it's very helpful to the public any other questions from the board or comments Just well put together report. thank you a lot of help <laughs> thank you very uh, much I one, oh one sorry question, one question has your have you all been accredited already the police department are you still working on it uh, we're still working on it how long does that normally take it depending on getting how long it takes to get all of your your stuff together a mm -hmm. year to 18 months is what i've been told oh, okay. um, is a normal standard time frame that we're on track for that pretty close mm -hmm. there's been a couple of snags here and there but pretty close to the 18 months. It's going to probably be closer to 18 months for us. How many are in the police force right now? Right now, as far as which? On your on your staff? or Okay, so right now what we currently have is we do have a, the um, 
contracted security company yeah. that works here. And then off-duty Corpus Christi police officers, I have about 28 that rotate, rotate. the different hours. Okay. Okay. There, there's always two officers per campus at all times at, of, of, of hours of operation. Yes. Okay. That's been the plan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. So our next item under staff reports is an update on our tuition and fees. As requested by the board, we're going to have an early discussion now. We won't take action on this item, but this will give an opportunity for the board to digest some information so that we can uh, have a, an action item after the first of the year on tuition and fees. Yes. Uh, anything else you want to say? I, in I would. That? I would, yes. And, and as you mentioned, Madam Chair, that this has been a request for the regents to add uh, earlier conversations. Um, prior to setting a tuition for the, for, the, for the following academic year. Historically, uh, the months of February and even March are the time frames that we set out, uh, that we have to uh, set tuition to begin registering students for the, for the following fall. That will be the case this coming uh, February uh, 2019. Uh, historically, uh, tuition has, has uh, the, the rates have been set. Sometimes we've held the ground and, and, and gone with zero increase and gone with minimal increases. And, and then we're, and we've had some other more substantial increases over time. Um, we've had several discussions over the years, and, and now is our opportunity. Uh, we're all ears, Mr. McGarcia, myself, and the rest of the executive team um, are all ears and want to hear your position on, on student charges. We're going to use the words tuition and fees for today. And, um, you know, we want to have a robust discussion about that. We want to take uh, your, your perspectives uh, forward as we uh, prepare a recommendation for early this spring. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mr. President, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Um, I'm not too sure how to follow that. I think uh, Mr. Es Dr. Escamilla just took my thunder here. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, but that's okay. Thank you. So let, let's, let's, uh, let's get started here on tuition and fees updates. Okay, leading into the budget planning process in the coming months, today's discussion is on tuition and fees. As illustrated in this pie chart, it is a distant second in source of funding uh, for the college representing 23% of the total 2019 operating revenue budget. Semester hours, headcount, tuition and fee rates, and unemployment rates are key factors in uh, driving our, our <coughs> college revenue overall. So let's talk about annual credit hour production. So in this nine year history, credit hour production has trended in tandem with the unemployment rates. I'm gonna ask you to focus on this section right here. Unemployment rates pulled back starting in fiscal year 2011 and ending in fiscal year 2015 from 7.8 to 5.10. The annual credit hour production, 239, trended similar starting with 239,000 hours down to 198,000 hours. However, fiscal year 2010 and 2017 appears to be an inflection point whereby for the first time there's a divergence between the unemployment rate and the college credit hour production. The greatest growth for fiscal year 2010 occurred in the areas of language, reading, mathematics, and physics, social science, and public safety programs. For 2017, the greatest growth occurred in the areas of natural and social science programs and industrial educational program that includes the process technology. Well, now let's talk about headcount. My, my next talking point is really gonna, you're gonna really see right here in this particular section what I'm referring to. Similar to semester hours, our student headcount enrollment flows, follows the unemployment uh, rate trend. There's an increase in demand uh, uh, for our continuing education programs when unemployment rates are high due to poor economic conditions. These programs appeal to students who are seeking to reboot their skill sets and re-enter the labor market. On the contrary, there's a slight 
uh, contraction in our credit hour production as labor market conditions improved as evidenced by the downward trend in the unemployment rates. Now let's talk about tuition rate to tuition revenue history. So this is our nine year trend uh, in our tuition revenue history. Revenues peaked in fiscal year 2012 right about here at uh, $26.3 million when the unemployment rates reached 7% and recalibrated to 2014, uh, in 2014 to $24,024.2 million when the unemployment rate dropped to 5.5%. So you see a pattern here, very close, closely to the unemployment rate. Uh, as previously, um, Mentioned the college tuition revenue was not in parity with the unemployment rates in fiscal year 2017, right here. Uh, revenues increased by 400,000 from fiscal year 2016 and is partially attributed to the growth in our natural and science programs and other uh, industrial educational programs that includes our process technology. Okay. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd like to say also in 2017, coming in, um, off of the hurricane provided a lot of uncertainty for all of us and you know how enrollment patterns were trending and so forth really put us um, in a in a defensive mode and and I just kind of like to restate for history and I am I stealing your thunder again I'm sorry no no, no that's that's <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to do you're right but but so so that uncertainty is what caused reactions and and uh, um, you know, we had taken that on that 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 it hit an enrollment in the fall, and so because we were in that defensive mode, you know, out of an abundance of caution is where that increase came. That recommendation that was a very tough decision for this board to make, and I remember that uh, very well because you know we were still uh, unraveling everything after the storm. Um, that's not the case this year, and I and we know that, but I just want to restate so so as not to forget where we all were with that uncertainty coming in off that hurricane. You're absolutely right, we, we could have contracted significantly uh, from that outcome, but we ended up uh, 400,000 above the, than uh, the prior fiscal year. Okay, all right, what everybody's been waiting for, let's talk about tuition and fee history. The college has two methods for assessing <coughs> tuition and fees. Uh, this section right here uh, is driven by the number of semester uh, hours registered by the student. This next section right here is uh, based on headcount per, per semester hour, uh, per semester, I'm sorry. Over the last 10 years, the per credit hour rate increased from zero in fiscal years 2016 and 2017 to as much as $9 in fiscal year 2011. So as you can see here, $2 increase in the building use fee, general use fee, $2 there. And uh, if my math is correct, $5 in in-district tuition right, right here. So there's your $9, okay. More recently, the fiscal year 2019 tuition increased by $3 and student services increased by as much as $8. Um, as we heard from uh, uh, Natasha Perez earlier, those dollars are being used to the, towards the DMC Food Pantry Initiative and other student access. So very robust now that we have some additional funding uh, for our students. As a reminder, board policy 3.21 provides for a minimum increase of $1 minimum. per semester hour. Again, let's the, for, especially for the new regents, there's been, let me just kind of restate that. That's very important. This college has had a policy that goes back, I don't know when that, I don't recall, I can't remember when that was inst instituted. It's been here before I got here. Mm -hmm. And we've left it in place. We've talked about removing it and leaving it and so forth, but there's an automatic um, increase for of $1, it's $1 credit hour, correct? Yep, um, automatically institu instituted. Now the board, it, it's, it's automatic unless the board was, um, takes action to, to, to not move forward with that policy. So just FYI, so there's always a $1 per credit hour instituted. Yes. 
Uh, thank you for bringing that up, sir. Uh, you know, with the SACS uh, uh, process that's coming up down the pike, we also need are looking at our uh, board policies, and so maybe the timing is perfect to revisit this once again to see if it still makes sense. Okay. So on the out-of-district rates, the uh, out-of-district tuition is the same, but there's an out-of-district fee is at $50 per semester hour. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So you combine the totals. So if there's right. an out-of-district student, you combine the, the tuition fee and the out-of-district fee. In this case, in 2019, that will be a total of uh, $114 per uh, credit hour. It's about a 30% premium when you add it all up yeah. uh, for out-of-district yeah. students. And this is guided by state statute where they want us to do a price differential for district and international and state state, state students. And and uh, eight or oh, see, about nine years ago, um, that rate was adjusted. Um, it at one point was exorbitantly high uh, for our students, for out-of-district students. When we brought that number back down in 2010, well, excuse me, 2009 to an average um, out-of-state district with a significant premium of 30% still, um, we, we began to see the influx of out-of-district students again. And so just another piece of history that goes back almost 10 years now. Right, right. Okay. All right, tuition and fee history. Now let's talk about what our peers are doing, right? Okay. So. Uh, the tuition and fee structure varies in complexity, and uh, there's also a wide variety of fee types, as you can see here. For example, TAMU system has a wide range of fees, while community college fee structure is relative narrow. Also unique to TAMU system is their guaranteed tuition rates for four years, uh, but that, I, I believe, from what I read, under the State Statute Education Code, Section 54, I think it's mandated that four-year institutions have this tuition guaranteed. I have to need. I, I would have to revisit, but I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Okay. Um, Victoria College, South Texas, and Temu CC have what is referred to a differential uh, tuition rate that is based on the student's elected program. For example, a student registered uh, for the emergency medical service program at Victoria College is assessed a dif differential uh, rate of $75 per semester credit hour. A student registered with Temu CC's College of Nursing and Health Sciences is assessed a differential rate of $180 per student, is my understanding. The in-district tuition for Kingsville has the highest tuition rate of $120 in this, in this presentation, um, while Tamu CC has the lowest tuition rate of $50. Interesting, right? That doesn't sound uh, right. However, you, see, you will see in the next slide that the total cost of attendance. Sounds like, Raul, it sounds like we might have a, um, a discrepancy there somewhere, but nevertheless, we can verify. Okay. There might be some, there's something not okay well i gotta double check i thought i did but okay okay we'll double check that still getting perspective at the at the, at the end of the day we're still we're still at a, 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 a about a fourth of the cost a third of the cost maybe of our regional universities and that's that's their mission our mission it's the way it's always been and it's the way it still is today so it's a good segue into the next slide so let's take a look at it in terms of uh credit hours So noting that there's still potential error in this TAMU CC fee structuring, uh, I think we can still gain some perspective. Uh, when all the other fees are considered, TAMU CC has the highest cost of attendance, which ranges from $2,973 to $3,153, depending on the elected program. By the way, uh, this presentation, uh, we, we take into consideration uh, eight semester hours, which is the average registered hours by Del Mar student. Eight mm. semester credit hours. Okay. Coastal Band uh, ranks the lowest with a cost of attendance of $728. Del Mar places second lowest with a cost of attendance of $885. And Victoria College ranks 
the third lowest with a cost of attendance ranging from 1024 to 1344 depending on the elected program. Okay. So up until now, we've talked about credit hour production relating to our traditional students. Let's touch on uh, our continuing education program. The pricing structure for this type Excuse of program me. is even more complex. Go, Just a second. Hold on. Hold on. Um, I know this is a preliminary discussion, but I, at some point, would also want to see where Delmar stands relative to other community colleges in the state, not just the sort of three more local ones, okay. because we're a different. Yes. Pretty different. Than our large college region would probably, be, our large college category would probably be across the state. Yeah, we, yeah. you know, we've always, uh, I'll, I'll say, uh, I know what, I can print it off in my mind right now, but it wouldn't. Uh, so it's, we're usually in the top five, and I, I mean, and top being with some of the, some of the community, and the top five community colleges who charge the most. That's where we've tend to been. We were always in the top 10 um, for a lot of reasons, and it usually refers back to, um, those um, school districts, college districts rather, um, th whose service area does not match, that has the most inequity with regard to tax base and service area. The bigger the distinction, the higher the rate overall. And um, um, those Austins, uh, for, uh, Terrence and Dallas is where their tax base has been, is just exactly what their, you know, what their service area is, um, are able to keep those rates a little lower. Um, we will get that back to you again um, before we move into the February meeting. I know exactly what sheet. It's at TACC.org. I can, I can pull it out. Like I said, if I could just press print right now, that would be wonderful. Um, but uh, we'll, get that, that, we'll get that data back to get you a broader perspective across the state. Again, and then one other thing I'd like to add, just real quick, um, in that uh, economies um, have a lot to do with that as well. You know, as com economies are ebbing and flowing and so forth, you can begin to see the stress orders and, and the distinctions between um, the rates for the colleges. I'll just add that before I, before I get that um, document to you. And, and Ms. Uh, Jessica, if you could help me find that document, I know exactly where it is. We'll get it to you, emailed to you as soon as possible. Okay. okay. So continuing education. Um, So uh, I believe I may have mentioned the pricing structure for this type of program is even more complex and will vary depending on, on, uh, on the program. Uh, Delmar's pricing point for a program is based, for this type of programming, is based on the num a, a number of factors, including direct operating expenses, other source of funding, competitors' pricing, and existing marketing conditions. These are just a few of some of the programs that we, we, we have, um, which, by the way, earlier we talked about our mission we, we we stated our mission we talked about workforce prep and we talked about lifelong learning this is the core this is the essence of what we do senior education our pricing point ranges from five to 160 dollars Healthcare programs <coughs> ranges from uh, 50 dollars to 440 to 440 depending on the program uh, and i do have a few more Professional truck driving, that's thirty six eighty five, uh, and uh, as much as uh, four thousand. Looks like uh, career training is another one. Includes processing technology, which has been very successful for us in twenty seventeen. These range from ninety dollars to eight hundred and twenty seven dollars. That concludes my presentation. Any questions or comments? Does our continuing education operate at a break even? Yes, sir. Actually, we uh, generally we, we make money. Ahead. We come out ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The model is built. The model is built, and we've been very fortunate, uh, and we'll be rolling out more details on that in the coming spring on. Uh, as to as I'm, I'm getting a big nod over there from Mary Fuso in the back and a thumbs up because she's at she's at the forefront of those contracts and so we've, we've been doing really well with this economy. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, so I think with some of the refinements that I've heard uh, on the presentation, when we come back, if we can can have those comparisons um, with large colleges because that's the, the 
small, medium, large, and very large yes. uh, for Mr. Salinas's benefit. The state of Texas divides the 50 community colleges amongst those four size categories, and we're in the large college category, so that would give us similar size to uh, student populations across the state. But then we've also cherry-picked the regional uh, colleges as kind of our peer group as well to understand what's happening in the market. Um, so I think both of those perspectives, both of those frameworks are important for us. Especially with 90 plus percent of our students coming from the area. Um, but I'm going to look it up anyway because I've, I know exactly where it is. Um, but again, uh, Houston, Metroplex, um, Central Texas between Austin and San Antonio, I mean, they're, they're all varying levels of, of uh, um, of wealth. I will say that this is going to be an issue coming up, not at this session, but at the next legislative session. I think this is one of the, once we get through some edu uh, some public ed types of things at this legislative session, we can anticipate that service areas and tax bases and community college financing in general uh, will be um, questioned and reviewed. So stay tuned, but I'm going to try to find that and maybe send it out to you as, as sooner than later. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Um, these programs that you mentioned, continuing education like process technology, welding, uh, truck driving, are there any financial aid or Pell Grants or any loans available for those students? Yes, scholarships. Uh, we do have some form of financial aid, but it's not as prevalent as in your standard financial aid. There is a, a, a method that students can come apply. Generally, we do have a lot of third-party pay, what we call third-party pay, which is employers are paying for the tuition and fees, mm -hmm. or we also have several that are under contract. And so many of these programs are offered fully under contract to industry. And we but work as far as, but as, far as financial aid, like uh, as far as Pell Grants or financial aid, there's none. Pell Grant does that's not, not available for that. No. We have to money that is actually a, an offshoot of financial aid, but it's limited by percentage of number of students who are enrolled in, for credit and then okay. total dollars that are drawn, and so there's a factor there. It's, it's a very limited number. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there was attempts in, in previous, um, just in previous years to, to bring um, financial aid to these sorts of programs. There were a couple of pilot programs to also that also included dual credit. You know, they wanted to expand it into these workforce programs on the CE side, but that, that has not happened uh, to date. Is there any other information that you would like to have um, Mr. Garcia bring back when we hear this again in the spring? You have another question over here? Yes. I, uh, you mentioned that the average hours that our kids take is about eight? Uh, eight, sem eight, eight semester credit hours. Yes, sir. Okay. And then, uh, <clears throat> and maybe I missed it, but every kid that comes to school here, do they... Uh, create some kind of uh, contact hours or whatever, you know? Yes, that's a very good question. So our credit hour production for our traditional students does qualify to, uh, how would I say it, convert those credit hours into continuing uh, contact hours. Contact hours, yes, sir. And allows us to build the state for, for, for funding uh, down the line. And it's done in every other year. Oh, okay. Prior to the base year. It's not every single year. So it's currently we're in the, uh, just about the middle of the, uh, well, in the last half of the ba of what we call the funding or the base year. And so contact hours are produced according to the number of classroom hours. Right. That the number of students that you have for that particular semester are, are uh, logged in for, at, are, are, um, are locked into after the 12th class day. It's real complicated, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll sit down. It gets really, really granular, and I'm, I'm, I look forward to conversations to sit down and start breaking it all down. Because, you know, here you take a, you know, a, a person taking eight hours, and each class is, um, you know, eight hours is kind of a strange number. That's an average number, so that may have a lab in there that breaks it up. But if you, each each student takes a class, let's just say three hours, sixteen weeks. It's three hours a week. It's 48 hours times that one student, and then you multiply it, and it's in the millions. Okay, it breaks down into the millions of contact hours. Um, it gets really, really uh, granular, but um, I look forward to, and I encourage anybody um, to reach out to me because we will break it down and, and, and 
uh, for you, but it's going to take a little bit more time than what we have here. There is a statistical profile book that they gave to us in September. Yes, the Red Spiral book that I gave you. And so that has uh, a, a number of reports in it that will be very helpful to you. And you can call any of the staff and they'll help guide you through if you're looking for some specific information. But that that's very helpful. Mr. Bennett loves that book. Was it signed? <laughs> was it autographed? <laughs> was, yeah, was it highlighted and earmarked and <laughs> dog but, uh, <laughs> Now, it seems like if, if if that's our average, eight, out, eight credit you know, hours per semester, that would make it very hard for the kids to even qualify for a full Pell, right? Because they've got to be registered for 12 hours or more? Uh, so um, I would say they do qualify for Pell. Uh, the, the, the amount will vary depending on the number of, of uh, credit hours. That is correct. Mm -hmm. So it is my understanding that 12 credit hours would qualify for the full Pell uh, Grant Award, which I believe is yeah. 3400 or something along the yeah. lines. But, but yeah. to your point, uh, Mr. Salinas, that you're exactly right, though. You're taking eight hours. You're not going to get full Pell. You're part-time in it, and so you're going to get an appropriate amount, a percentage, uh, according to the package. Every package is going to be different. And that's one of our big uh, thrusts and one of our big opportunities right now to shrink you know, to, to get them to take more classes, you know, that this is our opportunity so that we shrink the amount of time that it's taken, you know, for our students to graduate. Right now, we're, we're at numbers that we're not, let's just say we're not satisfied with, and we're going to talk more about that in our strategic planning uh, meetings that we have in the future. But you're spot on. You know, these students are, are working. Um, they're, they have multiple jobs, and they're taking part-time, and it's taken them a long time to finish. You know, uh, when we went to the conference in Austin, I really liked uh, one of the comments that was made. And I usually make it to the parents and the kids, but I think now I'm going to be a little more forceful as far as saying this. You know, I always tell the kid or the parent, I said, hey, so where are you going to go to college? And he says, well, you know, I want to go to Texas A&M or Texas A&M Corpus Christi or whatever. I said, and so one of the deals that I'm going to do now is say, but wait a minute, why do you want to go to Texas A&M Corpus Christi when it costs four times as much when you can come to Del Mar you know, take your core classes, your 60 hours, then, well, they want to graduate from Texas a and I said, and that's what it's going to say at the end of two years mm -hmm. when you graduate, Texas A&M College Station, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, whatever. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to be out there doing more, trying to tell, you know, a lot of the parents, like, bring them to Del Mar, let them take all those courses and get them out of the way, and then, of course, you know, then you can go to Texas A&M Corpus Christi or whatever. But you're only going to pay two years that kind of amount of money. And so I think that's very important, you know, that I'm going to have to make sure. And, and I'm so blessed that, you know what, a lot of the parents, they really look up to my suggestions, my help and stuff, and I'm really going to be pushing that. Yeah. But, but And I don't know whether this is wrong or not, but I also am going to be pushing a lot for them to take the dual credit courses. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. my, uh, my granddaughter graduated with 30 college hours. That's awesome. Thank then she graduated in three years from Sam Houston State. And then her brother graduated also with about almost 30 hours. So, and that's not, they're not that expensive. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all a win-win situation for everybody. And so the parents need to know, the kids need to know, and, you know, they need to be informed about all of this because, you know, even in the financial aid, you know, you've got the TPEC, you've got the SEOG, and those are first come, first serve. Yes, and so all of those things are very important for the kids to know. And, and I know that right now, the financial aid office is really pushing it and talking to the high schools and, and informing them and educating them about the financial aid. So, you know, I just think we need to continue that, but we need to hit them a little more, hit them a little more, yes. because I think that the majority of the kids nowadays qualify for financial aid. Mm -hmm. You know, I really think so. But yes. anyway, uh, I'm really uh, happy, you know, I'm glad to hear all this that you're telling us. And it's very informal, and I appreciate it. Well, I want to thank you being the, the, the money person on the executive team for promoting our school and, and bringing in more students. It, it definitely helps the bottom line. As a segue into the bottom line, Mr. Bennett, you did make uh, reference to the break even. I do want to mention that our continued educational programs, uh, we do get contact hours recognition from the state. So that's also factored in our analysis in determining the pricing point. Okay. Any other questions? If you think of any additional questions, uh, you can certainly uh, talk to Dr. Escamilla or Natalie or Mr. Garcia and get um, 
get information prior to uh, the next next time we discuss this, which will be in the, I think, February or March meeting. I'm not sure which one. Okay. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of our staff reports. We'll now move on to our college president's report. Thank you again, Madam Chair. I'm going to move quickly. So on October 17th, I attended our quarterly Texas Association of Community College uh, Community Colleges uh, meeting. Um, I'm pleased to report that at that meeting I was voted in as, as an officer of the association. Uh, I took, and I'll, I'll just tell you, one of our presidents um, is leaving education to go work in the private sector, and I was nominated by my peers to step up and take his role as secretary and treasurer. I'll do that for about six, eight, seven months. In the summer, I'll trans transition over into chair elect um, as the uh, from the uh, as part of the Association of Community Colleges. That'll put me. Um, square in the middle of uh, uh, preparation for the next legislative session and, and, and at the end of the current. So I'll be doing a lot of work in Austin, being, bringing back a lot of reports, putting on a lot more miles, both on myself and my vehicle. Um, glad to do it. Delmar will be well represented at Tack and Cat. <laughs> it will. Between, between uh, Regent Scott or Chairman Scott and myself, we will, we will have Texas. Um, we will be in Austin a lot. And so look forward to that. So um, just a few short days later, um, on, a, on the 29th, I attended the Society for College and University Planning uh, in addition, um, in conjunction with our, one of our consultants, uh, Doug Lowe for, from the Facilities Planning Group, who is our programmer. And um, myself and Dr. Lewis were in attendance in, in Austin, just went up for the morning to present on all the neat things that the college is doing. And, and the title of the presentation was, um, an 84-year-old college in transition, basically. I can't remember exactly the title. It wasn't my present, uh, presentation, but uh, Doug Lowe did a fantastic job of teeing me up, and, 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 and uh, we promoted the college, and we had tremendous feedback from all sorts of university and college types of uh, uh, facilities and, and strategic planning types of uh, professionals. On the 28th, uh, the TACC Legislative committee met again. I'm on that legislative committee for the association as well as the executive committee, and now one of the officers. So um, it's we're very active, and and uh, we're meeting on a monthly basis in person. I try to do as much as I can by phone, which is every other week on Tuesday mornings for an hour and a half. Minus today, I think our, today's did get canceled, but uh, um, I was up there for that. So just a lot of things going on. And then on November 29th through the 30th, uh, several of you all, uh, I was able to join several of, of you all for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board's Leadership Conference held in, in Austin at the airport Hilton. Um, so glad to see you there, uh, Mr. Salinas. Uh, Coach, did, uh, that was a great opportunity to kind of, you know, jump in there and start hearing from, from our coordinating board um, at the state. Um, we look forward to... Um, working with them and again any questions you may have from there just let us know um, and just finally to conclude my remarks um, this Thursday it's an unusual day uh, it's not our usual Friday but December 13th will be fall graduation and uh, our keynote speaker is JC uh, Sheriff JC Hooper a good friend of mine a good friend of ours from the community college, from from the community uh, he has very deep ties um, to Del Mar College and i um, I will not steal anybody else's thunder, Mr. Garcia, so I will, will, won't steal our keynote speaker's thunder e uh, e either. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, from the sheriff. That concludes my remarks, and I'll answer any questions, if there are any. Any questions for Dr. Escamilla? If not, we'll move on to Regents' reports. And for those who were able to attend the Coordinating Board's uh, Leadership Conference, wanted to give you an opportunity to share uh, some information briefly what you've learned you can't share it all uh, in the course of this meeting but if you can share a couple of highlights for us and maybe we'll just start with Dr. Sherwood and just move around the table for those who attended um, there's just one thing I'd like to mention it was it was a great conference a lot of really good information but um, one presentation in particular which I'd encourage everybody to go look at on their website is was from uh, Timothy Rennick he's from um, Georgia State University, and they've done an amazing turnaround in their student success. And he went into a lot of detail about uh, how they've accomplished that. And I thought it was very impressive. Yes, it was. It was indeed. Thank you. Well, you know, it's good to see that Del Mar is doing a lot of the practices, you know, that are in place already, from uh, good standard practices to governance instead of management, you know. So governance is always important. Uh, but one of the things that did, uh, uh, to kind of get my attention was uh, 
the uh, the presentation we had on it being impact focused during emergencies, and we're we're doing some of that already. But when we talk about the food pantry, uh, the emergency loans for kids, uh, their education is impacted by an emergency. Uh, to, to have some type of uh, regent uh, scholarship or some available loans. Uh, but uh, it was a great, great, uh, well-rounded uh, presentation. Thank you for attending. Mr. You know, uh, one of the things that I heard there, and uh, I thought that was awesome because uh, they're talking about making it mandatory to when they register, they register for tutoring, and that was mandatory. And I think that brought it up as far as the kids doing well in school and all of that. I mean, it's mandatory, that tutoring. It's not something, you know, you tell them you've got tutoring, eh, someone will go, someone won't. But if it's, it's like mandatory, mm -hmm. I think that would be, a, you know, something that maybe somewhere we need to just look at it and see because, I mean, I, I thought it was really good. I thought it was really good. Lots of work coming around with what's called the QEP. Um, that's the topic. Um, for our accreditation self-study that we'll be doing is largely around that. And there's lots of talk at the uh, legislature around counseling, and that's kind of good and bad. The thing is to get ahead of those things ourselves, be proactive so that the state doesn't uh, require us to do any of those things. But uh, thank you for that feedback. Next. Dave? Oh, yeah. I thought Nick was <laughs> Yeah, um, it was a good conference. Everything happened real quick. Um, the focus on these meetings with the coordinating, coordinating board is always going to be the 60 by 30 Texas. It's entirely student-centered. It talked a lot about the goals that we need to achieve. And they go over it and over it every time we go to one of these meetings, but it's, it's worth repeating. And I think we're doing good as far as from what I've heard as far as meeting some of the goals and where we're at right now. Uh, some of the sessions, I attended the one that Nick's talking about, and that was very, uh, you never think about a lot of these colleges actually have homeless kids attending school and trying to help them out any way that you can, especially like with the food pantry like Nick was talking about. And the, I mean, even the students that are working and coming to school, they all have problems and eventually being to provide uh, an emergency loan, like Nick was saying. Uh, we talked a lot, and this one, not only the 60 by 30, but I think the focus is also on ethics. Uh, some of the conferences talked about governing board members who serve public college and universities fulfill their considerable responsibility in a complete or a complex legal environment. We need to prepare to address issues like open meetings and the records laws in Texas. Uh, another one that we talked about with 60 by 30 is having to deal with the legislature. The legislature needs to know that we're meeting the goals and working hard on what they want us to do, even though we don't get funded properly. And the funding issue came up a lot. And I've heard this at several conferences that uh, security is going to be a big, big issue. And the governor's even thinking about hitting some of the rainy day funds for that. Uh, the rainy day funds are real high. I think they stand at about $16 billion. And if it goes any higher, they actually want to address it. Now, where it goes, we don't know. Uh, I guess a quote of the conference that I heard that really hit home uh, was from the Honorable Kel Sillinger, Texas Senate District 31. He said, the rainy day fund is like, like the Hope Diamond. You can look at it, but don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I've got a complete report here that I'll leave with Carol. And uh, if anybody wants to see it or share it. it Thank you. Let's remind, so, we'll so get this PDF notes. and share, yeah. send out to the rest of the board. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Bennett? We've got a nationwide trend of increased in dual dual credit enrollments. So our percentage is going up just like it is nationwide. Uh, what I found interesting in Austin was they said they now advertise to the junior highs. That's their client. The ninth graders are going to be the dual credit. So I found that interesting. And there will be, that's one of the items on the joint uh, legislative agenda is to look at dual credit, look at how it's handed because there's there's some conflicting rigor kinds of, of comments coming out of the coordinating board and some legislators. And so that's one on, on primary things on our legislative agenda to make sure that we uh, protect uh, and still do, do right on behalf of the students in the state of Texas. So it's a good discussion. That, that issue came up a lot when they're talking about pathways. Mm -hmm. And some, one of the meetings talked a lot about that, about uh, 
working with pathways and and, and another thing on that same subject was the number of hours these students are accumulating before they get their associate's degrees and that's very costly yeah. and then they they lose their their grants so they can't finish their bachelor's degrees so we've got to help them manage their money that's actually one of the goals of 60 by 30 uh, they don't graduate with more than 60 percent of what they should have or more than 60 percent what they should have spent working on their degree and that's going to have to deal with advising um, the advising issue came up a lot. Some of you may remember that uh, I served on a year-long uh, committee as a part of the, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and the purpose was to take one piece of that 30 by 60. It was the financial literacy piece, but having to do with money. And so we can go out to, I think I provided you, Dr. Eskimi, the full copies of the course, but it's out there on the website. There's some tremendous best practices that other schools are doing that if uh, that something that we do want to get into that it's there's tried and true things we can do so I think those will be important discussions during our strategic plan what is what is Del Mar College's response to that look like so so bring back these discussions and when we get to that point in the strategic plan I think it'll be very important Good. anything else on the coordinating board conference thank you all for attending taking your time out to do that it's an, it's important work and and I know it, it helps it helps with the orientation and being able to check off a couple of those boxes for new regents, uh, but it is always good information. So so thank you all for going. We will move into our uh, pending business um, list that is in your agenda. Uh, we've heard the Cleary report today. I think the uh, CCRDC tax abatement update will not be in January, but we'll get moved to the February board meetings. We are not having a meeting in January. We'll talk about that in calendaring in, in just a little bit. Uh, but we've got a heavy February agenda, so I think you need to count on uh, the whole day. We'll probably move some of those into workshop uh, or even our maybe our ethics ses uh, training session and closed session in the morning or something like that, but we'll work on on that so I think you need to plan on a full day in February when we meet because there's there's several important things that are coming up there you can see in March we have some um, policy revisions contract reviews in April a Civitas update uh, Mr. Salinas Civitas is one of the programs that we use to track student progress and it's uh, relatively new to the campus so we've asked them to come back to us on a regular basis and give us uh, an update on how the software is being implemented and used uh, and what we as regents need to glean from that so that will be that update in April uh, along with that tax abatement yearly review and then you can read the, the rest up there anything to add Dr. Uh, yes I just like to point out that uh, number eight the SACS COC and QEP updates that's our um, that's our accrediting body the SACS COC and this the QEP is a quality enhancement print uh, plan for the college this is something that we are in the midst of that there's a reason why half the executive team are is, is uh, not here they're in attendance of the annual conference uh, attending both the orientations for the new set of standards uh, that we are uh, that we fall under now uh, the 2018 numbers uh, or standards for SACS have been um, just re recently uh, instituted and voted upon I think it's less than a week now and um, we have a team up there that is focused on that. You will be hearing on a regular basis uh, beginning in February about, uh, about our march to 2020 and ultimately 2021 when we conclude our um, self-study and focused uh, evaluation of our, of our programs here at the college. It's a very onerous, onerous process that has been streamlined, albeit, um, that we are required for, uh, to do to exist. Uh, as an accredited body uh, the reason why i point that out is um, recently in, in in recent news you've been hearing about other entities and so forth that are locally struggling and we'll, we'll we can get into that a little bit more later but the importance of our accreditation cannot be overstated or understated it, however you want to look at it this is an important this is the most critical one of the most critical processes here so stay tuned we're going, you're going to be hearing a lot about SACS, COC, and the Quality Enhancement Plan. Thank you for highlighting that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, with nothing else on Regent comments, we will move on to our consent agenda. We have several items, uh, several board minutes um, in that consent agenda, it, acceptance of the investment uh, for October and November, and acceptance of financial statements for September <laughs> and October. 
Is there anyone who is requesting any of those items be pulled for separate consideration? If not, is there a motion to uh, adopt the consent agenda as presented? I'll move to second. second. <laughs> motion by Mr. McCampbell, <laughs> second by Mr. Rivas. feels so good yeah. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Are there any public comments on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion passes. And we will now move on to our regular agenda and the discussion and possible action related to our 2018 annual audit presented as the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, CAFR, uh, for the fiscal year ending August 31st, 2018. We have our auditors from Collier, Johnson & Woods here, Ms. Bridget Cook, and any introductory remarks, Dr. Escamilla? I, I, I'd just like to thank the staff. We, you know, we go through this annually and annually there is a tremendous amount of work uh, that goes into this for so from everybody across the college uh, specifically those uh, in the business office who have helped put this together in the countless hours uh, we thank you uh, the gentleman passing out the forms behind us is uh, one, one, especially one of those but and, and I know uh, Dr. West is with us I know there are many others back in the office still um, working away that have helped with uh, positioning in us uh, for our annual audit and certainly to Bridget Cook and her team um, whom we stay in regular touch with um, along the way uh, for all for getting us to this point and with me I have today um, Adam Miller who was one of the primary people who worked on your, ah, okay. on your audit this year there he is okay I was wondering okay And is this presentation in our packet or this is separate? No, the mm -hmm. presentation isn't in your packet. Okay. So um, I, I thought I'd just kind of go through the highlights of Thank the financial you. statements. And um, with that, the letter that I'm passing out that has the standard uh, information provided to you all, I just want to point out one big thing on here. Um, last year, as I was preparing for this, I was looking at my notes from last year, and I was telling you about GASB 75, which stand, which is the implementation is being implemented implemented this year um, into your financial statements, and it relates to OPEBs, which is other <coughs> other <coughs> post employment benefits other than pensions. And so, um, in my notes, it said it's going to be similar to GASB 68, that was our pensions that we implemented in in uh, 2015, um, but. I'm going to tell you more about this, but this one is a lot bigger. And just to give you, you know, a high level, high level uh, uh, thing about it, it's the number basically. The um, estimate for our pensions was like 13 million, which hit our hit as our liability on our on our balance sheet. Um, the the number for the net OPEBs benefits is 73 million. So oh a big God. a bigger number to look at. Um, on your audited financial statements, uh, our, just to give you a brief overview, we have our, um, our two, just two main sections, which is our basic financial statement, which includes your statement of net positions, which is similar to a balance sheet, your statement of revenue and expenses, which is similar to an income statement on a business, and, your, your, and, the, and the notes to the financial statements. So this is basically a business type presentation that's required for your entity under the, uh, under the generally accepted accounting principles and GASB. The, in addition to that, there's required supplemental information which includes the management's discussion and analysis and then some other required supplementary information which is the, uh, uh, specific to the pension and the OPEB liabilities that we're talking about. And I'm going to point these things out to you that they're in separate sections, primarily to tell you that my audit opinion is based on the basic financial statements. So I'm expressing an opinion on the fair, that they're fairly stated in all material respects in compliance <coughs> with GAAP on the basic financial statements, on the required supplementary information that's provided for additional analysis purposes. I do not express an opinion on it. 
um, I do apply limited procedures on those areas. And those are included in page 19 and 20 is my audit opinion on, on the CAFR, which is if you're looking at your board presentation, I want to say, I put numbers in here somewhere, it's about 140, I think, if you're looking on that sheet. But. Okay, so um, in addition to those two sections, there's also some statistical tables that also are required by the, the coordinating board in GASB, as well as um, uh, some specific, more detailed reports that are, are breakouts of your revenue expenses on schedules A, B, C, and D. But most importantly, you have an unmodified opinion or uh, a clean opinion on the financial statements. And just to go through a few, I'm going to go through a few of the highlights on page 45 of the, of the financial statements or page 178 in your um, PDF page on your on your board packet is the statement of net positions, which is similar to a balance sheet. It's showing that for the year, your overall assets and deferred outloads, out, outflows, which are added together, have increased by $114 million. Of that, the primary reasons for the increase include the cash and investments, which increased by $86 million, primarily because you have more cash than you did before, it's restricted for the most part, but it's from the bond proceeds that were issued during the current fiscal year. The, um, in addition to that, you have capital assets that have increased by $27 million, <coughs> largely due to the construction projects that are going on. And then on that side, you also have deferred outflows, which increased by $2.1 million for the OPEB offsets. Um, and then you also have other, they're offset a little bit by some of the other um, OPEB, out, I mean the other deferred outflows. And uh, outflows are considered as an asset side, and then you have inflows on the bottom. And those are really just timing difference between the measurement date for your actuary reports. Um, <laughs> and anyway, if you want to know more, I would love to tell you more, but we might want to have a workshop to explain that part to you. So anyway, on the highlight, as on, the, on the first side, your assets are up $114 million. Most of that's in cash. On the liability side, your liabilities and your deferred inflows increased by $191 million, and it's two things. It's the bonds, $111 million, and the OPEB, which is it rounds out to $74 million in your net OPUB liability, and then there's an additional inflows of $16 million that are added to that section. So that's your main increases there. Now, your overall net position um, decreased significantly because one of the things about the, about the OPEB liability is, it, and this is something that everybody had to, I mean, all the colleges and, the, and all government entities had to implement this year. Um, and the way the, way the, um, the, way the pronouncement GASB 75 requires that to be done, the initial uh, measurement date was as of, as of the, uh, I mean, as of your, your year and last year, so August 31st, 2017. And the reason for that is that you can't do an actuary report that quickly. So you can't do it for, for this year. You can't do it for August 31st, 2018. You had to do it for last year, and then they implemented it this year, and they showed that initial amount that hits your books <coughs> as a prior period adjustment. So you're, you're, prior pe you're, you're restating your net positions to last year. So... If, you, if we're going to, before I get into the detail on that, I want to go through just the actual, I guess, your net income statement, your actual performance for the current year. And so on page 47, which is your exhibit, uh, is it exhibit two, which is your net, your statement of activities, it's showing that your, your current year activities increased your net positions by $10 million. And there's several components of that. Um, your operating 
your operating revenues were have decreased and primarily in state grants where you where you um, had had completion of some of your grants your TWC skills development and your TWC nursing skills grants which decreased I guess because they were they were kind of over um, additionally an offset to that your scholarships and allowances increased and discounts a lot of that is uh, the that's a negative to your re revenues because you're you're giving more allowances and scholarships allowance and discounts probably primarily because of dual credit and some other uh, programs that are, are a little uh, lower cost for the students and then your overall tuition and fees increased by 500,000 is that excessive or is that in line the increase in tuition there was a it's, it's in line. Uh, it's a snapshot in time is what it is. Yeah. It's a timing issue of what you see there. You know, grants are down. Mm, not really. Hold on tight. You know, things are coming. And uh, so, so what you see there just happens to be what was going on at that particular time. And that you'll see the next time the numbers may be Different. Right. very and much to the positive and, of and that. And kind so, of what I'm doing is I'm comparing it to last year. Yeah. So, you know, from one year to the next, you, you know, those things do change, and there's different components. I'm just trying to give you the highlights, the highlights of those. Ms. Cook, before we go on, I have a question back on page 43. Uh, when you talked about the, um, the net position being lower, but that's the, let me ask it in my non-accounting, but I'm, but I'm trying to understand <laughs> voice. Um, if you there it shows at the bottom of that page that there's unrestricted loss of 58 million and yes and so if if we had not had the increase in assets based on construction and the increase in cash based on our bond sales for the new construction we would actually be showing of less an, a negative net position correct um not exactly, not exactly. okay probably I, I, and i, I let me skip forward. Uh, let me sh show you what. Actually, it's it's a lot of it has to do with your GASB seventy five. Right. Um, if you look to page forty seven at the very bottom of page forty seven. Okay. This is your statement of activities. I kind of have it. Uh, I learned how to do snippets, so it's up here on the board mm -hmm. as well. It's showing you how you come down to an increase in net positions of nine million nine uh, nine million nine thirty two. That's basically your earnings, so to speak, for this year. But see that the cumulative effect of of the accounting change regarding to GASB seventy five is a, a whopping eighty six million dollars. Right. So basically, we're bringing onto your balance sheet this giant liability. Okay. And that's the OPEB. Yes, and that only f I think there's only four other community colleges that did not come into a negative position as a result, is what I'm hearing at the state. I think maybe four. It could be. Yeah, yeah of the 46. Everybody, everybody's showing significant. Yes, uh, showing um, these these significant uh, negative uh, net positions and so forth. Um, it's the Tarrant counties and it's the Dallas counties. It's it, again goes back to what we were talking about with tuition Those service areas that are the tax bases and vice versa Those are the districts uh, Lone Star. I think is the other one um, that um, of the th four that I can remember um, that are not so it's it, it, it's, it's, it's it's a huge okay. number and just like you know, we thought we thought Gadsby the pensions, GASB 68 that came out in 2015 was going to be huge, right? Pensions, we're going to finally book the liability that we actually owe people, um, you know, that will eventually retire based on a present value and actuarial study of what, you know, what's going to happen. But on the OPEB side, I think it's it's nationwide. It's the, the problem is, is that health care costs are soaring, and darn it, we're living longer. The combination has caused the actuaries to come up with a, a huge number. So it's really, actually, they're doing us a favor because this should have been booked. I mean, a lot of businesses already have been booking, booking these kind of things. That's why, you, you know, that's, that's, the plans are generous, but there are, and, and there's, it's just a huge amount. 
of money. And so what what does GASB 75, is there a time frame in which we have to whittle this number down? Or no. Is it, no? Okay. I mean, you know, all of that, I, I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of discussion about how it's going to happen or whatever. It's just you finally, it's always been out there. It's just not been on your balance sheet. <laughs> so all GASB 75 said is we got to book that liability. And so that's the, that's the cause of that change. So I mean, you look compared to last year, you go you went from 130 million in net position to 54. So that's right. That's the, that's the, that's a huge number. Bridget, I think Mr. Garcia wants to comment. It's present. There, you there go. we go. Okay. Yeah, if I just may add, um, you know, keep in mind that this whole pension liability is funded by a sister. Uh, agency at the state level and so yes we do recognize a liability so if you look at page 45 you'll see in our non-current liability total of 86 point 86 million dollars represented by the pen, net pension liability and the net OPEB liability essentially we may not have to pay out this amount of money unless unless the agency uh, uh, does not have the financial strength that I think it has today. Uh, otherwise, you know, you start seeing a collapsing of, of, the, of the plan, and then eventually could very well be that uh, an alternative source of funding may have to come up, and I don't know how the pension rules here are at this, at this state. I know the state of Illinois is facing similar questions. Is, is whether or not the state can enforce the community college or the four-year institutions or those agencies to fund this liability. State of Illinois it says pretty much the state's going to take care of that plan. Doesn't, doesn't necessarily, does not necessarily hold those agencies financially accountable as of yet. So, so again, more to come. We definitely need to keep an eye on the on the Texas Teachers Texas Retirement System, continue to monitor their their audited reports, uh, make sure that their opinion is still clean. Which, by the way, it is clean, uh, based on the 2018 report that I saw. Uh, but also taking a look at the financial resources that exist there today on a regular basis, so that if we start to see uh, a dwindling of resources, then we need to ask those difficult questions: Who's going to foot the bill at the end of the day? And so what this, with this audit counting adjustment, all it did is says, hey, uh, you sister agencies need to recognize that liability, but at this point in time, the, the, the pension system is the one that's managing those financial resources. So nothing is coming out of our pocket as of yet. It's only those uh, deductible dollars that are coming out of our payroll to fund the system, if that makes sense. So other post-employment benefits really is health care, is what I'm hearing you say. Health care. Okay. Um, and I think Texas might be different than Illinois, but um, I know on page 87 it, it's showing our share and, and ERS's share, but it's, 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 um, it's all going to, you know, at, at this point in time, like, like you are paying a share of that. Like I think um, part of your outflows, there's like $2 million that you pay a year towards that, towards the health care health um is that correct john yeah right now you're the college is paying like two million dollars for for health care for retirees so so that's the that's the amount that we paid for 2018 so it's not it's i guess that's part of it is it's a liability but you're not going to have to necessarily pay it all in one year and you know it'll be adjusted and all, all of that but it's it's one of those things but anyway that's it's just something to be aware of yeah okay I'll let you continue I just I, I wanted to understand that number a little bit better and what our our timing was on dealing with it right right <laughs> I think um, also I think part of it is it's the school districts are different than the colleges here t as yeah. well and and we're keeping tabs at the state association this is very much a part of both Takubo the state you know, uh, business officers group as well as TAC cat and the Teachers Association. Okay. Right, so it's, anyways. It's, but it's, I think it, it's also a good thing that we're booking it and we're aware, we're aware. Oh, how do we go? Previous.
much better. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty smart, but everywhere I go, the technology is just a little bit different. <laughs> just try to keep you on your toes. Okay, so let's see. Um, so back to the very, after all that, the very boring net income statement <laughs> showing you some ma major differences. Um, I will say the MDNA is a really good source of general information on the financial statements in the compare. It's a narrative form of this format of this information too, and that is prepared by management. So, uh, anyway, your um, operating expenses overall increased by 2.2 million. Uh, of that, the primary components were salaries of 1.2, employee benefits increased by 2.8, which is mostly, like I said, gas fee 75. And your your um, your op, your O and M costs decreased due to higher repair costs in 2017. You had some major repairs on Richardson Auditorium and the mold remediation on another building last year. And your non-operating revenues, once again, the story basically is your taxes are up and your state appropriations are up, which gave you an overall increase of $9 million in non-operating revenues. And the the uh, state appropriations increased. You, you all are probably pretty well informed about that. But increased base funding last year. And also, as a, por a portion of that OPEB, you had um, included in non-operating revenue a portion of the state's part of the OPEB's contribution because you, well, part of it, it's very complicated. <laughs> and um, ad valorem, and in, in your ad valorem accounts increase. And your in interest income went up because you had more cash, more investments, cash and investments. Anyway, so that we kind of covered. Anybody have any more questions about Gatsby 75? <laughs> it, um, I think the hardest part is every time I think of OPEBs, I have to go, what is that again? OPEBs, it's other post-employment <coughs> benefits other than pensions, basically, health insurance. In addition to our regular audit, the last part, um, we have a regular audit opinion. Then there's three more audit opinions. They are the uh, the required government over the grant uh, government funding over the grants, the GAO requirement over internal controls over financial reporting, and I'm here very happy to say that um, the auditors reports that there were no we did not that we did not identify any deficiencies in internal control over financial re, re, re didn't identify any deficiencies that needed to be reported to you. And I didn't find any instances of non-compliance related to the grants. Also, we did significant work on the grants themselves. We were required to do a report for both federal and state on those grant issues. And that's on page 143 and PDF page 276, which both expressed clean opinions on the major and and uh, federal state grant, uh, grants that were tested as well as no non-compliance issues were noted this year. And a good source of that information is on the very last page, which kind of summarizes the findings for the whole audit, which is one of the required schedules for, for the report. So, finally, no management letter will be issued this year. And um, we'll, this will be once again submitted to the GFOA and uh, if uh, some of the new board members, the college has received the, the GFOA certificate and, and excellent financial reporting for the last nine years? Eight years? It's eight. Eight. eight well, years. It's going to be okay. nine. It's going to be nine eventually. <laughs> yeah. But it's a true, I think it's eight. Right. Right. So that's, that's quite an achievement. And... I want to say thanks to accounting and, and the grant people, um, especially John Johnson, who worked diligently on Gatsby 75 <laughs> and Gatsby 68, which there's a bunch of information you have to accumulate um, in order to do that. Um, and everybody did such a great job. It was It's a lot of elbow grease in, involved in yes. the audit. Thank you very much. Are there other questions <coughs> for Ms. Cook? Mm -hmm. Bless you. Mm -hmm.
Yes, Mr. I, Bennett. I do have one. Um, I attended a financial seminar up in New York, and it was trustees and regents, and they seem to have generally a misunderstanding of what an audit is. Could you explain to us what an audit actually is, an audit opinion? Okay. They, there seems to be some implication that it's an enhanced internal control, that you're going to catch the fraud. Oh, I got you. Uh, and, you know, that's one of those things where, um, I mean, we've managed by, I think there was an act about 10 years ago where we, uh, called the Clarity Act, where our, our audit report, uh, we got it down to three pages, or up to three pages. And, and one of the things I think that, if I were going to explain what an audit is in lay m person's terms is, first I would say, look at that actual opinion. Because you can see where it says, what are we reporting on? The headings that they put in the report. And it tells you what my responsibilities is and what management's responsibilities are. And basically what it's telling you um, is it's saying, these are management's financial statements. They're not my financial statements. My responsibility is to come in and test those. So what I do is I come in and I ask questions um, about their internal controls processes and then you know I document those I do a risk assessment of what are the risk areas for uh, errors or fraud to be occur but the purpose of that is not that I'm going to detect fraud necessarily but I'm going to take a high level one mile up I'm gonna I'm the end result of my audit is going to be this report that says your financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects. But I'm going to I'm going to ask those questions. I'm going to look at the processes that you have in place, and then I'm going to d design tests based on that on that um, questionnaire and the answers to those questions, and dig a little deeper to see if those processes that you say are in place, those internal control processes, are actually happening. Now, if I start finding a bunch of mistakes or problems with that, I will dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper. But in this case, we didn't have that, you know, we didn't have that issue. So that's, that's basically what the audit is. So it's not a fraud examination. It's the purposes, a high level, uh, that makes sure the numbers on the financial statements are, are correct and that they're material, materially correct. And then in addition, for government, you also have quite a bit you have to do on the grants. Is that? That helps. That helps? Yes. And we would, you know, in the past, we've, it's been a long time, but uh, Mr. McCampbell had us do like a workshop. And um, I mean, I know usually when I say either the word accounting or actuary, I see a glazed <laughs> look over people's eyes. But if you want to know more, I would, I, would, I would recommend that we do some kind of little workshop to kind of go through. Because there are, it are a lot of, of requirements as far as this book is concerned and anybody who wants the book <laughs> right can have one <laughs> and, and actually are, one of the points yeah. is like the management letter there were years um, having done this audit for several years there were years that we had management letters where we found problems within the internal controls and sometimes you find those and then you saw you know you you're able to determine that the numbers are not wrong in the financial statements, but we would write a management letter with recommendations on how they could improve internal controls. But you all have had a continuity of staff and, a, and good staff um, uh, over the last several years, and they've, they've really worked hard to um, have good procedures in place. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. I would like to add uh, our kudos to the staff as well. I know that, that uh, you all spend a significant amount of time on this, and, and we appreciate the no management letter. We appreciate the, the lack of any substantial findings or any findings of, of, of concern. So we know that, that that is due to the good work of our staff. Carol, I'll just add that what is nice, if we think about where we've come over the last decade mm -hmm. in audit, is not just that we've always had an external financial review, which is what they're doing, but we've really picked up the internal controls regularly, and to me, it gives me uh, and I bet it does, Mr. Bennett, more comfort knowing that we've got a robust internal controls audit function going on. Now we've got the external audit function going on with the financial statements, and it really helps build a, a stronger community college in, in terms of the protection of our assets. Absolutely. 
Is there a motion to accept uh, the 2018 uh, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report? Make a motion second. by Dr. Sherwood, second by Mr. Rivas. Any other discussion or questions <coughs> from the board? All those in favor adoption of that? I am so sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there any public comment on that regular agenda item to accept the CAFR report? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion passes. Uh, we will now go into uh, public comment, uh, general public comment prior to um, our closed session. So if uh, I think we do have a person or two. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. <coughs> uh, Mr. Jack Gordy. And there is a handout that he has asked to be passed out, so we are making, will make its way around. <coughs> yeah, I, have, I think I need a couple more over here. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I didn't <coughs> Mr. Gordy? Yes, my name is Jack Gordy, and I live at 4118 Brain Drive. Uh, all of you, except one of you, got a letter should have. Okay, you should have gotten a letter in the mail regarding a, a, a information request that I turned in. Well, I asked for all the payments that was paid when Bruce Olson went to court, when Del Mar went to court. Well, the information I got back said Del Mar had only been to court two times. Well, I know better than that. He'd been to court more than two, five or six times total, not two. So I turned in another request, and I'm still waiting for an answer. The date on that request was October the 25th, and I'm still waiting for an answer. That just don't make no sense. And all of you has got another request I turned in. And the last two paragraphs is for the Board of Regents, the last two paragraphs. Uh, it's regarding when me or anybody else turns in a public information request and Del Mar wants to withhold the information, they have to get permission from the Attorney General. Well, why can't the college attorney write the letter to the Attorney General? He's got all kind of samples, but no. He calls the lawyer in Austin, and the phone call alone costs $400. And for that guy to write the letter is another $450. That's $850 for one. And I don't know how many letters has been sent to the Board of Regents, so I requested that information. Like I said, that college attorney should be able to write the letter to the Attorney General. A week's training should have give him enough knowledge to write the letter. So I'm asking that last paragraph, insist that the college attorney does what he was hired to do, not hire somebody else. All that money is coming out of the taxpayer's pocket, and I think all of you is paying taxes. I'm paying taxes, and I don't like somebody wasting my money, and that's what, exactly what's happening. So. There's no sense in hiring somebody else to do what he should do. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Uh, next, we'll have James Klein. Members <coughs> of the board, thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, I'm kind of mentally shifting gears a little bit away from Blue Books to talk to you right now, so forgive me if I'm a little bit disjointed. Uh, my name is James Klein. I live at 3501 Walter A Street. I teach here at Del Mar College. I'm also the president of the Del Mar College chapter of the American Association of University Professors. It's in that capacity <coughs> that I'm speaking to you today. And I would just like to reiterate something that I mentioned to you several months back, um, uh, reiterate the need really for faculty council to report directly to the Board of Regents as it did in the past up until 2011. I think that making <coughs> this change would allow you and members of the board uh, to learn answers to the questions uh, that I think the board members really need to know uh, questions like, uh, what is the faculty view of the college's uh, consideration of adopting an eight-week schedule, course schedule? Is that a good idea or not? Do the faculty like that idea or not? Um, what is the faculty's view of the changes, uh, proposed changes, to the academic dishonesty policy? 
changes that were proposed by the Faculty Council Committee uh, more than four years ago already uh, that have not been acted on yet. What is the faculty's view of the decision, rather sharp and sudden decision, to uh, restrict use of, sharply restrict use of DMC all of TFAC and faculty listservs on campus here? What is the faculty's view of the dismissal of Dr. Bruce Olson several years ago? Uh, what is the faculty's view of the decision by the college to construct a south side campus several years ago uh, as well? And I think that uh, in the interest of shared governance, I ask that you talk to members of the administration about faculty council reporting directly to the board as was the case, as I said, until fall of 2011. Resumption of this reporting will improve the functioning of Del Mar College for the betterment of students and for the betterment of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Uh, the board will now go into closed session, if you'll allow me to read these three items. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't have your card. I apologize. Please. Call for anybody else. Uh, being please come forward. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, sir. No problem. Ray Rose. So, some of you know me. Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, I noticed on the annual security safety report that you folks were addressing today that the compliance committee lists Title IX coordinators, but you're required to have a 504 coordinator and ADA coordinators, and they weren't included. And it would be nice if they were included in that compliance piece. And then I looked on the website to find a 504 coordinator, and there was no information on the website. So you might have some work to do on that. But the more important thing, and it fits with some of the discussion that you've had, and I think it fits under um, make Del Mar greater, <laughs> the, um, planning that you've got coming up. Um, I've had a concern ever since I was at Houston Tillotson about developmental ed courses and you folks are doing developmental ed courses. I have talked with a couple of you back a couple of years ago about looking at alternatives, and I would like to encourage you in your strategic planning to take a look at alternatives to developmental ed. In the past five years, I have yet to find a piece of research that supports developmental ed. All the research talks about alternatives. And when you're looking to increase your student retention, when you're looking to keep the student debt down, you want to take a look at ways to get rid of, provide alternatives. I'm not talking about just get rid of developmental ed, but find alternative models that will be a benefit to all the students. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Thank you. And I apologize, is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? Thank you. Now we will uh, move, into, move into our closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.076, security devices and audits regarding the deployment or specific occasions for implementation of security personnel or devices, and two, a security audit with possible discussion and action in open session. B, Texas Government Code 551.073, prospective gift regarding the deliberation of a negotiated contract for a prospective gift or donation with possible discussion and action in open session. And C, Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel regarding the pending or contemplated litigation or claims or a settlement offer including cause number 2012-CCV-61123-2 and appeal number 13-18-00159-CV Bruce Olson versus Delmar College and the seeking of legal <coughs> advice from counsel on pending or contemplated legal matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. We'll now take a five-minute recess to uh, clear the room and allow regents a break. And the time is 3.11. Thank you, sir. Okay, the board, the board has come back from a closed session at 4.06 p.m. There are no action items uh, coming out of closed session. On to calendaring. Um, as uh, Dr. Escamilla noted earlier, our fall graduation is on Thursday and season celebration is on Friday. Staff will begin their winter break on the 19th and come back on January 2nd. Um, in, in emergencies, if there is anything that needs to be done, the, the college president and, and public information will get a hold of us as necessary. But if we don't hear anything, no news is good news over the winter break if, yes. if we don't hear anything. That's correct. Um, 
We will not have a board meeting in January, but there will be Community College Day uh, up in Austin on January 30th. I think there's been information sent around about that, so if you're interested and have not yet indicated your interest, please let uh, Natalie, uh, Jessica, Delia know uh, in the next few days so they can get that, that uh, registration done for us. Yes. We will have our combined January and February board meetings on, Janu on February 5th. That is a week earlier than normal uh, due to the Association of Community College Trustees National Legislative Summit uh, in Washington, D.C., and there are, I think, a board member or two that are planning to attend that. Uh, if you are interested, on February 5th, 6th, 7th, there is also a Texas Pathways Board of Trustees Institute uh, that's going on at Horseshoe Bay. So I think you travel up following the board meeting on uh, the 5th and the conference is all day on the 6th and partially on the 7th very important information there if you can take it in if you can't we'll figure some way to get that information back to you all maybe in a workshop fashion but um, that would be encouraged if we could uh, have somebody out there and Texas Pathways is an initiative of the Texas Association of Community Colleges and the Community College Association of Texas Trustees so it is supported by our state association. It's one of their uh, sister organizations. And so if there is, uh, it's being conducted by the Texas Success Center, is that correct? correct. So Horseshoe Bay is by, is by uh, Marble, Marble Falls. Falls. Marble, Marble, Marble <laughs> Falls, West. northwest of Austin. West. It's a good four and a half, five hour drive from here. Um, so if you are planning to attend, I think you need to plan accordingly and and while february is going to be a long board meeting that's what i was talking about starting earlier in the day so if we do have folks that are planning on going uh, we can get you out of here uh, hopefully earlier and then our march board meeting will also be a week earlier than normal due to spring break so we will have our board day on march the 5th uh, there will be a del mar college day at the capitol on march the 7th uh, so we're going to take students up to Community College Day some, but we're also then going to take a select group of students and uh, as many regents as we can and executive staff up for Del Mar College Day in Austin as well. So we can uh, have a more targeted, um, more targeted discussions with our service area representatives as well and senators and, and, and then key legislative folks about, about what's going on yes. and be able to, to brag about our successes in the state. Carol, on that, for planning purposes, uh, and Mark, correct me, my understanding is that some of the activities may start the evening of the 6th? So preliminary, um, I mean, just preliminary. types of, yes, So um, in terms receptions. of people blocking calendars, we may want to, you may want to plan on being in, in Austin by the evening of the 6th. Early evening. Right. As early in the evening as possible, and we'll, uh, we'll line that out, right. but uh, especially regents um, for, those, for those purposes and those activities the night before. Um, it would be ideal for people to get there and then uh, st we start early the next day We'd like to wrap everything up by midday so we can all get home that evening yeah. Half day Wednesday half day Thursday we drive time at noon on Wednesday and drive time in the afternoon of Thursday to try and block it. Yeah. Correct. Thank you for that. Thanks, Thanks for that clarification yeah. And then we don't have April on there, but I think April will be back to our regular regularly scheduled programming <laughs> 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 Will yep. be the plan well, we, we already know our spring commencement speakers, Dr. Kelly Quintanilla. So, there we go. <laughs> so that's uh, jumping into May. Jumping into May, you're right. Um, any other questions or comments about calendaring? If not, then the board meeting is adjourned at 4.11 p.m. Thank you all very much. Tuesday, <laughs> <laughs>